Welcome to the Buy Box Bandits Podcast. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Buy Box Bandits Podcast, episode 170. We're back from Miami Sellers Conference. We'll have a recap episode up with Taylor and Navy probably in the next couple of days as well. But we were lucky enough to meet these two gentlemen in person for the first time. Then uh, Taylor and Grant uh, from uh, Cheddarsoft and uh, OA Cheddar and everything. They said they've been uh, retail arbitrage and OA sellers for over 10 years, which is pretty OGs great. in the business. Um, so yeah, <laughs> clearly a lot of longevity and have been able to prove that this is a sustainable business. And we want to drop a lot of game for you guys on what that actually looks like because people getting into this, some see it more of as like a temporary thing and are worried about the longevity of the space um, and everything, which we're going to uh, get into and touch fellas. But uh, you guys want to just kind of fill in the uh, BBB audience and you know who you guys are and how you got started. Yeah, sure. Well, we're happy to be here. My name's Grant. Uh, I'm the older brother of the two of us. Taylor's five years my junior. Um, I call him my big little brother because he's about three feet or three inches taller than myself. Uh, That's back in two three feet. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> three feet yeah. Uh, so yeah, I started my Amazon career back in 2014. Really was like the first full year of reselling all retail arbitrage. I was working as a full-time plumber um baby on the way stuff like that it was a it was a crazy time and by 2017 i brought my brother over out of car sales to help with the retail arbitrage business at that time was doing some coaching um and so yeah that's kind of the history that that then we moved into doing a lead list business back in in 2018 pulled taylor off the road at the end of 2019 to help manage the oa business uh, the oa lead business called oa cheddar and uh, and then now we're doing software and and transition to online arbitrage in 2020, which yeah. was just in time for like the COVID things changing. We didn't know that was coming. Yep. Uh, I think that was just a God thing, right? He just uh, gave us that inspiration, I guess, to make that shift. And the timing was perfect to to go from RA to OA in 2020. Yeah, because I remember, you know, first seeing your guys' stuff when I was just getting started in 2021, really with OA. And everything. So what does retail arbitrage actually look like back in 2014? Because a big part of what makes it effective these days is like Selleramp and Keepa and having data and having other sellers on the internet and stuff. But I assume it was vastly different. So what did that actually look like? It was even different back in 21 when I did retail arbitrage. Can't even imagine what it was in 14. Oh, yeah. No, uh, I mean, I can speak to that since I was doing pretty much all of our buying uh, we weren't using Selleramp. Obviously, that wasn't out yet. So it was Scoutify too through Inventory Lab. Um, and man, I mean, for us, like our motto was scan everything. And that's kind of, you know, Grant Grant got that advice from a retreat that he went on uh, from, a, I think, a seven or eight figure seller and then took that mentality to us. So I'd walk into a Marshalls or into a grocery outlet, Walmart, and would just scan everything. Right. And we ended up finding like that niches and stuff, of course, you know, clothing, Nike, on Adidas, Under Armour, that kind of stuff. Um, but it was a lot of, it was a lot of just scan and check and just keep going. You know, how many scans can you get in within a minute? Um, and at that time too, I mean, analyzing Kiba was opening up a completely different tab through the extension. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was fun and it was also a lot of work. Exhausting. Right? Yes. It was exhausting. I mean, we would travel around where we lived in Washington. We were kind of away from a lot of stores. So other than our hometown, we'd have to travel about two to three hours to the next town. So I would go out on a road. Um, see, I would go out uh, on one trip, source for a full day, stay at a hotel, source another day, drive back, unload the truck, and then repeat that process. So that's yeah. a good life though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean a lot three of hotels with points. Like that, I mean, you can't beat it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you're out on the road though, I will say I'm happy we switched to OA because it was just a lot less time sourcing a lot more. It's nice being home around your friends and family. Cause it was a lot of traveling back then, but there is a so, itch though. I still miss it when I go into a Marshalls. I go, I bet, I bet those shoes are good. I want to pull out just the scan and feel scan something around. here and again. Yeah. We put uh, like so Miles, and actually, Miles and I actually spent two or three hours answering questions on, on several different OA panels over the over the weekend, mm -hmm. and I feel like a big common denominator across a ton of the different questions was people that have had success with RA or doing some sort of scale RA and looking to make that transition. And I feel like for most, it's more intimidating than it should be and could be. And so yep. take us back to kind of your transition back then, but even more importantly, kind of 
give us the blueprint for maybe a full-time RA seller doing, you know, having success with that to start to kind of shift that mindset to now start to buy some stuff online. Yeah. So it was the end of 2019 and we hadn't really sourced a lot from our leadless service. We were pretty stuck in, in our ways with RA. We, we enjoyed it. We were good at it. Uh, we were efficient. And so it, I actually sourced some stuff. We actually sourced some stuff from our leadless business for Q4 specifically. And we're like, okay, some of the best stuff we sold this December was from our lead list. Like, and, and I needed Taylor's help with the leadless business. So, so we had talked about several times, like we should start doing more OA. And I just, if to be honest, it's funny because we did years of, of, of running an online arbitrage leadless business very successfully, but I was afraid to make that leap of, uh, and, and go into that other model. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the biggest thing that I was concerned about was just tracking all of the orders and making sure that we stayed organized. Um, but once we made the transition, it just kind of ripped the bandaid off and said, look, we're, we're sourcing about $5,000 a day, four days a week. We need to do that. You know, we need to spend 20 grand ish on inventory with OA and we're just going to, we're just going to pull the plug and do it. Um, a couple of weeks in, we were glad we were doing it. Taylor was able to help me with, with the leadless business. And I wouldn't say that there was that much, to be honest, I think there was a lot of time freedom. And so the, yeah, the benefit from... Fantastic. Well, yeah, because he'd spent he'd spent easily eight, nine, ten hours a day into a store, into a store, into in stores doing retail arbitrage, with OA and buying right off of our list. Granted, we're simple men, right? We're not getting into the rabbit trails too deep at this point. We're just buying right off of the live data. We're able to do all of our sourcing in like three hours. Yeah. So it was just a huge, huge time benefit. So give me so if I've never bought anything online, only only in store. Give me the call it the three week blueprint of, of where I should be spending my time. Is it stuff I've sourced successfully in store? Should I be trying new brands, maybe specific sites, specific strategies? Give me the like the three or four week blueprint that guarantees success, no matter how long it takes that like guarantees success. If you're coming in from retail arbitrage into online arbitrage, I think you should try to stick with your niche. Like we felt very comfortable with shoes and clothing. And so we gravitated towards that with OA, but we also did a lot of health and beauty as well as well. And we were kind of spread out uh, pretty wide. So I would say though, if you're speaking that switch, stick to what your niche is and then kind of expand from there. Um, I think lead list, depending on, you know, are, are a fantastic tool. Uh, I have, you know, if you have the time and maybe, uh, a, you know, maybe not a lot of capital, I think they're great starting off points where you can see what's on a lead list, see what the sources are, what the brands are, the sales, and then explore rabbit trailing from there. If you have more time on your hands, or sorry, less time, but a lot more capital, I think getting as much data as you can quickly so you can cherry pick the best of the best items is the strategy and the way to go. Um, and then as far as like, you know, what, how do you repeat that process? No matter what strategy you do, you should always be going back to what you're selling, right? Going back and looking, okay, what is selling? What worked, right? What, what did I order from that supplier and it arrived correctly? It was a UPC match. Everything went beautiful. And I, and I got off into Amazon and I sold it for a profit. Can I, can I repeat that process, but on a grander scale? And so, and that's a strategy that we're doing in our own business right now. And I think we bumped up our buying by like 30 to 40% buying just replans and it's simply just going back and looking at what did we sell a month ago? How does it look like now? Has the price tanked? Has it recovered? Is there inventory available? You know, let's go and double, triple or quadruple down on the original investment that we put on it and expand for there. So I tell people I cast a wide net and I find the honey holes and then I exploit those honey holes. Yeah. Cause at its simplest form, right? There's really only two types of OA products, right? There are the 95% the of it is either a big brand, Nike, Adidas, Puma, whatever, that's carried mm -hmm. on a bunch of different websites, or a small brand that primarily only comes from the brand website or like a Walmart private label, Athletic Works, whatever, yeah. right? Therefore, it, at least the case for the small brands, you quite literally know for a 100% fact where that inventory came from. You know mm -hmm. it came from the brand website. You are in complete control to have a burner email address and go create an account on that website and let them very handsomely tell you when they're running their discount. And then keep a product finder tells you the best performing listings in that brand right there. Yeah. Now, the bigger brands are more scalable, more available, more competition because they come from more places, right? Yeah. The compounding nature of that is, is going 
and going website by website. How can I get items cheaper on Kohl's? How can I get items cheaper on Puma? How can I get items cheaper on Shop WSS? And then after like six months, you know how to get, or, or talking to any other Amazon sellers, whatever. Like, you know what discounting mechanisms work on those websites. And then it becomes really feasible to always have stuff to go out and buy. Now, another thing I started thinking about earlier this week is utilizing the like Google Sheets with SellerAmp, right? You can one click export. Anytime mm -hmm. you see an item that's historically profitable, put it on a spreadsheet. Put a little right, note, right. XYZ prog. Now, if we want to get fancy, shout out Jameson Philippi for this. Set the Keepa alert on that product. Yep. And then, because we know, okay, say it's like a small beauty brand. We know where it's coming from. We mm -hmm. know what it retails for. We know that they have a 15% coupon that pops up, whatever, that we can use again and again. You set the Keepa alert, and now it notifies you when the product hits 29 every single time, which if we look at the past three years or year, it's happened mm -hmm. every three months there. So now- Right. breaking this down, say that listing sells 900 times a month and there's 18 people on it. Say you can make, you know, 300 bucks profit on it across a month. If you get three, two sales a day, which is low for any good product, right? If that happens three times that year, you might've just knocked out, knocked out 1% of a hundred K profit a year goal right there. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. you might've gotten that from finding an item and it's not good today, but it's good historically. It was good three times the past year, putting it on a spreadsheet, setting the keep alert there. That I think is a wildly underrated way to do this stuff because you literally, if you if you source at all, you find examples like that every day. So do you guys do any neat stuff like that to track replans or you know anything like that? Like how do, how do you guys think about that type of stuff? So we don't set Keepa alerts normally on our OA stuff. We should be. And it's something I'll probably bring to my team and have them do. Um, but what we do do is we put everything into Cheddarsoft right now. And then we go back and when those sales are, are happening, we can go back in, we can source, you know, say it's Nike.com. I can type in Nike.com, pull up that supplier. I can update the stats with it, which pulls updated Amazon pricing. And then we just filter all the old results. So so we do something similar, but the nice thing about that is we're capturing leads that maybe we didn't purchase, right? Maybe we, uh, when well, they that's came the on, big thing. that's what everyone yeah. needs to do, right? Every yeah. single person needs to do it. And everyone's life will get substantially easier over six months if they did that. Oh yeah. No, a hundred percent. And we're seeing that now. I mean, we're, we're on a quest right now over the last four or five months to double our Amazon store size and just double down and, and full disclosure. I mean, we we're, 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 I don't know what you want to call it, Grant. We're lazy. <laughs> we're, we're, we're cavemen. <laughs> We like we have a team. We have an amazing team. I have a team of of forty plus VAs. Uh, some that, and that kind of wavers in between forty and fifty, but we pulled over a few of our VAs because uh, into our FBA business and are starting to teach them on sourcing and going back in through those old products and you know taking advantage of the sales that are happening today and the results they're pulling are fantastic. Um, but yes, exactly that. I mean, go back in and buy the stuff that you did buy or the stuff that you didn't buy. You know, I mean, there's leads that we see all the time that I can tell like, hey. You know, the, the rise in offers has already happened. It, this has just got onto our lead list. I'm going to avoid buying this for today, right? It's not it's not something I want to invest money into. A month, two months down the road, that could be a, a, a fantastic product that no one's looking at because it lands on a lead list once. They they look at it, don't like it, and they forget about it. So yes, keeping a, an ongoing list of products that are close to profitable or are profitable are a fantastic idea. So yeah, you kind I mean, of just be... casually glossed over the fact that you have 40 yeah, virtual yeah, assistants. Yeah, I, I know I did. That's awesome. Yeah, and that's I, amazing. I mean, and I know, I personally know a lot of people that struggle to handle one or two. So mm -hmm. give us the breakdown in terms of the what that entails, right? The sorts of virtual assistants that you guys employ, their tasks, you have managers, supervisors, team structures, um, and just kind of give us some sauce on how you are able to manage and kind of accumulate all of their efforts. Yep. So we saw it, we started off small, just like with anything else. So we started off with two VAs. Grant hired them for this coaching business. They were doing video editing. They were Grant. What else were they doing? They were uh, back then. It was tasks. Yeah, Shopify drop shipping from AliExpress was something I was doing <laughs> back then. Uh, yeah. And then they just I, I had some coaching clients that needed needed more leads, and I was and I said, let's go ahead and and I honestly just gave them some courses and said, watch these courses, see if you can do online arbitrage. They started producing leads pretty soon. We were getting really great feedback and that turned into scaling that up and, and selling a lead list. And then eventually up to 11 lead lists uh, sold out, you know, for several years, but go ahead, Taylor, because Taylor's really the manager of the, the VA team below him. We have a couple, well, he's the, the head honcho, the general manager, and then he has a couple managers below him. 
they have team leaders below below them, and then there's a bunch of lead generators below that. And that's specifically for the OH header lead business. So our Amazon reseller business is very dependent on the OH header data. So we kind of have a cheat in that we're getting 100 plus leads, you know, pumped into our cheddar soft account every day for free, I guess you could say, uh, since we own OA cheddar and and the team that's producing that that uh, service. Yeah, I but think go ahead, Taylor. Oh, so, yeah, my bad. Yeah. So we, we started off after that. Yeah, we, we started off small and then we ended up hiring, you know, we had two VAs, they were producing leads and we realized, okay, well, we need to get a couple more. So we brought on two more. Right. And so, uh, and then from that team of four, we just kept hiring a little bit more at a time. And then the leaders started showing themselves right within our team. You know, the ones who would communicate really well were, were huge, right? The ones who, who were bought into our mission statement that were hardworking and honest people, they kind of rose above and, and, and it was obvious. And so those people end up becoming a lot of our managers that we have today. So, uh, out of that team of 46, I would say just guessing off the top of my head about 40% of them have been with us since 2019 or, or earlier. Um, and it's just building relationship. I mean, we run a team meeting every single week where we go out, we just finished doing bios. So everybody on the team, this is how awesome uh, virtual assistants in the Philippines are. I gave them a task. I said, Hey, just on one sheet, put a picture of your family, who you are, what are some of your hobbies, you know, what some of your dreams are. Uh, if you could give advice to anybody who was new to our team, what would it be? And, and that's it. Right. And I gave them like a one document, you know, a little rundown as an example, these guys freaking made amazing Canva projects, full on videos with audio input in and just love to talk about their life. Uh, and so building that relationship, I think is the most important part in, in running any sort of team that you're doing. So if you're starting off small with, you know, your first VA, or maybe you're, you have a small team of two or three, understand who they are, build a relationship with them. And, and we learned that from the conference, you know, Soros and his team. I mean, I love what he, what he showed that video he put out uh, on Twitter. If anybody wants to go check that out, it was just him loving on his team. That's, that's, that's really what he owes his success to. And now, like he said, at this point, he, you know, he doesn't have to work on his Amazon business. Like they, they bought in it. They're on mission together. Um, and I think that's the most important part, being available, always checking. And then, a couple of things that we do, I think, differently than other people with our team is like everything's monitored. So screenshot monitor on on when and when they're working. And for us, that's just because we want to make sure our leads are coming organically and not just being passed on from one service provider to another service provider. So I need to be able to go in and look and see like, hey, they found this item from Target. What were they doing before they found this lead? Oh, yep, they they found it from Target. But ultimately, like there's a lot of trust that's been established between our teams. So it's not like I'm monitoring anything that they're doing every single day. It's the ones that stick out that like, hey, you know, we just had a guy who who were trying out and, you know, every five minutes he was delivering a lead. Well, I mean, you have to be one of the best sourcers in the world to find a, a profitable lead every five minutes. Right. And so sure enough, we ended up having to, you know, invite him to leave uh, the team because of that. Um, and I think it's just balancing checks and relationships and slowly building it up over time. Yeah, because what a lot of people are worried about is like, okay, like what, how do I avoid, uh, that was a good question from the panel, right? How do I avoid a VA working for a bunch of other people? So um, it's the kind of thing at this point that now that I've had, you know, uh, one editor with me for two years, right? It's like, okay, you know, you kind of get, it's like on a human to human basis, if they trust you, if they see a path forward, it makes sense. But, you know, for the people who are a little bit worried about that, it, it makes, and it's a complete valid concern. So how do you kind of avoid that, especially when it's someone, you know, maybe a newer entrepreneur, their first year, second year, uh, getting the right people, hiring, and making sure that that person isn't just you know pulling leads from elsewhere and essentially scamming that uh, their employer. Yep. I mean, um, I was screenshot. just going to say. Go oh, sorry, Taylor. No, I was you, just going to say there has to be some level of accountability, right? We we take screenshots. We we've learned to see essentially fraudulent behavior. It, it, lead generating is a very um, it's a very specific look, right? When you're going through screenshots, you can see if a lead is found organically or if they're just, you know, and they'll make mistakes sometimes where they're, they'll pull up a, a, a spreadsheet and it's like got some other business's name on it or their other employer, or they'll, a browser will be, something will happen. And so we have a team, we actually have several people going through screenshots on a very regular basis, looking for fraudulent behavior. Now, and we say fraud, when, fraud to us is essentially just not organically, you know, uh, finding the leads and then delivering to them to OH header exclusively. Now, obviously there are certain things that we, that they could be doing behind the scenes that we can't police. 
And I think that's where the relationship really comes in. Birthday gifts, Christmas parties, uh, regular communication, team culture. They, they often tell us that, you know, being a part of OH Cheddar is like having a family. When they do the bios, they're all learning about each other and realizing we and we preach this. You're not just working for OH Cheddar for yourself. You're supporting yourself, your family and all everyone else here and their families, including mine. Right. Including Taylor's. And so helping trying to get them to buy into like a bigger vision than just their own personal selfish desires. And, and we all have that tendency. Um, and so, again, just having them buy into something bigger than themselves is really, I think, the way to get them to really, buy, you know, uh, bring their best to the table. Right. I and mean, to hire the... 40 virtual assistants, you guys have had to probably interview hundreds, if not thousands. So do you guys have a specific process in terms of filtering out a lot of the fluff? A lot of people that aren't serious about your job or just working in general. I know yeah. so kind of what that process is. So we have an application process, of course. Um, right now, I actually don't do any interviews. I have our gal. Her name is Rubia. She's amazing, right? So She's been, she was she was our third hire. Actually, her husband was our third hire, and then she quickly replaced him, um, and he went back to the office. And she she meets with every single one. She makes the decisions on who we're going to hire. Okay. She she also uh, part of the interview process. She sits there on a screen uh, recording and just watches them source for a half hour. You know, she's an amazing sourcer. She was good to find, you know, 10 plus leads a day, uh, mostly on average. And so she knows exactly what the process looks like and can tell when someone doesn't know what they're doing. Right. Yeah. How much of it is buying versus building from like a, a training and onboarding perspective? Like, is it paying top dollar for someone with really good experience or is it culture fit? How do you guys think about that? It's it's a culture fit for sure. Um, and it's definitely we have an onboarding process where, you know, they 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 go through and they understand, OK, here's how we want our leads formatted. Here's our criteria. Here's everything that you need to know to get a lead approved. And then at that point, it's just the, the feedback loop. So we have like a quality control team that goes through the leads and anything that they reject or anything that maybe they that gets delivered as an honorable mention, the good, not great type leads, there's feedback given to them. They know exactly why the lead didn't get approved. They also have the ability to rebuttal that, that decision that the QC team uh, member made. And that goes to me. Or, or I have a VA that I'm training to kind of be a mini me right now. So she's very talented and smart and I trust her judgment. Um, and they also know that if it's not my name that that made the decision, they have a time that they can meet with me after our team meetings. That's always open, no appointment necessary. Just stay on the the, the call. Um, they also have direct communication with me, so they can always send me a message, and and we'll get the we'll answer it that way. So, constant feedback loop. There is a culture that that gets bought into. Each member has a team leader. Okay, that team leader has is a, is an established uh, lead generator, and also shows great leadership skills. And so they can go to their team leader for, for, you know, questions or for a little bit of training. We have a Rubia, same gal. She also does training. So, you know, anybody on our team can book a call with her and she'll do one-on-one -on -one training to help them overcome any obstacle that they're running into right now. Um, but we don't, honestly, we don't really look too much for experience, even uh, somebody that doesn't have any experience, but is good at communicating, asking questions, has a place on our team to try it out. So, yeah, right? I mean, it's not rocket science, right? Yeah. And we also changed up our process before. So before we would do a lot of like online jobs.ph, we would hire them. We would, they would fill an application where we would ask them certain questions. We had our own kind of like banana test. Shout out to Corey and his talk at the Miami seller conference where we would ask them, what's your favorite thing to do on a Sunday? And for that, we just want to understand like who the, who their personality was, right? They're saying, Hey, I spend time with my family. We go out we go hiking. We go out to the beach. It's like family person. Great. You have a, a reason to come to work wanting to crush it. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's like, oh, I have to go party with my friends, you know, no, no, no harm in that. Like I used to party when I was with my friends when I was younger too. But, you know, if it's between the two of them, I'm going to try to pick the family man. Right. The guy who's who or, has, gal. or gal. Yes. Honestly, gal, <laughs> gal, <laughs> our best VAs are girls. They're, they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I'm trying to go circle back to what you were saying before. Um, the banana test that Corey brought out though, I thought was genius where he, Essentially, somewhere in his application, he just says, puts the word, you know, reply to this job post with the subject line banana, right? Mm -hmm. Tells you they can teach, um, that they understand, you know, instructions and can follow it and things like that. Um, but yeah, they I know it's enough to actually read the job description, That's not just blindly yeah. yes. apply to a whole bunch of them. Yep. Oh, and then we right now we have like, I, I call it like our lead gen funnel. 
So you can come in, somebody can come in and join our team and it's a, it's a pay per lead type model, right? $6 per lead, you come in and, and for every approved lead. And then if they want, there's a pathway where they can join our core team where there's an hourly rate, you know, benef benefits in the form of uh, 13th month, pay time off, holiday pay, things like that. Um, and, and, and they get that security of an hourly wage and then they get a bonus based on production. So that's actually been a great system right now because we can mass hire, right? Bring in a bunch of people, give them a shot, it controls the cost. And then we can find, you know, who's the ones that stick out, who are really producing, who are asking questions, right? And then we invite them in and, and there's a, a simple process that they can follow and get into our main team and get all the perks that come with that. Sounds yeah. like we need to find more Rubias in the world, Miles. Yeah, facts. That's, that's a, <laughs> yeah, a good, may not, one may good VA will that. change everything. Yeah, that, that's a good tweet there too. So you guys were lucky in that you guys already knew each other and that you guys had camaraderie. You guys worked together on the stuff that makes it a lot more fun, a lot easier, a lot more doable and such. But uh, I'm curious, were you guys talking to other Amazon sellers online throughout the years? Because that was by far the biggest factor for me. And ultimately, the biggest differentiating factor I think I see from looking at a lot of sellers, like the sellers who are having high quality Amazon conversations on a day to day basis, dominate the people who don't talk to any other Amazon sellers. So was the community a big thing for you guys? I, I think I'll answer this. Uh, to be honest, a lot of the of my career, our career, I think Taylor and I, we've kind of been in our own little sandbox, our own little echo chamber uh, until about a year ago. And I say that just because, you know, being a, a, a thought leader, I guess you could say, and being, you know, owning OA Cheddar and having people come to us to ask questions, you know, we're always the the smartest guy in the room to a certain degree. And that's not usually the, I'm, I'm realizing we've learned that that's not the best place to be. And as we're looking to double down on our store and, and scale things up and increase profitability, I actually had, uh, went to Hawaii in May with my wife for the first time. And I don't know, some, some light bulb went off. I came back home and I told Taylor, like, I'm going to go and like socialize. Cause I, I like to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, cause I, I got my wife, I got my three children, you know, we're busy, we're building, we're, we're running the lead list business. We're running the Amazon store and the team there and teams in, in both of those. And then also developing software it just felt like there just wasn't enough capacity to really branch out and talk. And so I actually, I went on YouTube when I got home to said, okay, who's out there that's, that I should be listening to, uh, got on, on Twitter as well. And I found you miles, literally you're like the first guy I found oh, yeah. seller ramp, seller ramp, seller ramp, you know, day and night. And I was like, this kid's awesome. And then of course ran into you Garrett because of your guys' relationship and Warner and all of that, um, got on X and just, I've been just, in the early stages of being, and this is actually some really great advice, I think, for people who are new to selling on Amazon. In the early stages of my career, I was so passionate and excited about the, the potential with selling on Amazon that every waking moment, I was scrolling through, at that time, Facebook. And I was reading every yep. single thread, every single comment, and I was learning so much. And a lot of it didn't apply to me at the time. But when it did, I had that that database of knowledge kind of embedded away, that, that, that filed away into my brain that I could pull those things out. And what really the key to that wasn't necessarily having all the answers because you can't remember everything you read and learn, but knowing how to ask the right questions because you've read it somewhere, right, can be really helpful. And so essentially I decided I'm going to come back and I'm going to just, I'm, I'm done being the, the, the leader, it, it, you know, uh, the talking head or whatever. I want to put my student hat back on and get into the trenches. And so that's exactly what we did. And I've been doing that really since May of last year. It's the reason I went to Miami. I started listening to the Buy Box Bandits, telling Taylor, like, you should listen to this. You guys you guys interviewed the guys that ran, ran the conference. And I was like, we're going to go to Miami. We're going to socialize. Like, literally, totally outside of my, my comfort zone. And, 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 and Miles really telling people, put yourself out there, build relationships, build a pod, hang out with your guys, your boys, your stallions. And that's, I'm like, that's correct terminology. I'm like, correct terminology yeah, family. yeah, I'm 37 years old and I don't want to talk to people, but I'm real. but I say that not because I'm right, but just because I'm growing and, and, and maturing in this area and realizing how important it is to really, to really build that, uh, that core group of people. And so I, I would say, yes, we talk to sellers, I, but Taylor and I are usually, I spend most of my time talking Amazon with this guy. And so there's just not a lot, there That's hasn't been a lot of though, outside. Like, you yeah, know yeah. what I'm saying? Right. Cause most people got no one. Right. And, sure. and the, like one is so much bigger than zero. Right. Yes. You know what I mean? And and that's yeah. the key is like, you guys were obviously lucky. So a couple of our buddies 
that were at Miami as well. Kaj and Josh, they're friends from IRL too, best friends, literally. They, they run the business together now and such. Um, but like now they're putting a lot more effort into that too and such. And I'd say like, that's the biv- biggest differentiating factor, man, is who you're talking to on a day-to-day basis in any capacity of life, but, but definitely with selling on Amazon because it's so niche. So much information is very niche. There's no yeah. formal education around it. You have an incredibly small chance of knowing people are IRL that do the stuff. You guys were obviously lucky. Garrett and I are lucky that we live in Pennsylvania, 40 minutes away from each other. So we ended up starting to hang out within a month or two of meeting each other and such. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, and how you were saying, you know, you were just reading all the info in like Facebook groups, like that stuff doesn't cost money. That's what's beautiful. Like anyone who's listening to this, you guys can go to the exact same thing. Follow as many accounts as you can on Twitter, follow as many accounts as you can on Instagram or wherever you consume a lot of content, you're going to passively pick up on a lot of information by doing that, that you don't necessarily have to pay for. That's going to pay off over time and uh, such there too. And uh, last question we got for you guys, if you could go back and tell your uh, yourself when you were a beginner Amazon seller, some game, what are you telling uh, them? What are you telling him? I guess. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think, I think to answer your question, you, you just asked, the answer to the last question is the answer to this question. I think that I would have started going to events sooner. Um, I would have gotten out because in the early stages of, of my, my Amazon career, I was alone. And I remember, you know, hiring my cousin uh, a couple of years in and he was right. He would ride around the truck with me and I would just word vomit everything that's been in my head about Amazon on this guy. And I mean, he'd just have his head up against the window, probably just like wanting to crawl out of his skin. He couldn't stand to listen to it anymore. But I, it was so good to have someone to just talk to and to hear me. Um, and then I, like, like, like you said, when I brought Taylor into the fold and started just pouring into him and then having that uh, uh, recip- reciprocate that, it was so incredibly helpful. So um, I think what I would tell somebody or tell myself 10 years ago is do what I'm doing right now again right? Get on social media, pay attention to what, what the young guys are talking about, read the threads, read the comments, respond, reply, build your, build your friendship base, go to events, meet people in person. It's crazy. Like we wouldn't be talking honestly, Miles and Garrett, if we hadn't met in person in Miami, that's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. I get to, I get to get on a call with Sawyer, 18 year old, $10 million. Yeah. Yeah, He was saying, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to meet with him after this. And so I'm super excited about that. That would have never happened without going to Miami. So get to events, meet people in person, shake hands. Uh, and, and and I I would say too, when you go to events, don't worry about what you're going to get, worry about what you can give. Cause there's always something you can give to somebody, um, by just, uh, leading with love, honestly, like throw fear out the door, lead with love and, uh, you'll win. Cool. Dropping bars. All right. And then where can everyone uh, follow up with you guys? Uh, if they got any questions or want to take a check out any of the stuff you guys offer. Oh, at oh. oh, com is, is the lead list, but also the software is where you can find information about the software. Uh, I actually, after me leaving Miami, I'm like, man, I'm getting myself on Twitter and like you get putting myself out there more. So this is fun to say for the first time, you can follow me at Twitter at, at big done FBA. That's, That's D U N N F P A. And then Grant, you have a, you have a Twitter as well. Yeah. And at Grant T Dunn. Boom. All right. Okay. Cool. Guys, we can get you guys some followers here. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I we, saw Taylor. You tweeted two hours ago. That's, that's good stuff right there. Don't, don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call brands. Yes. Get those wholesale yeah. relationships too. Not just LA. Cool. All right. Appreciate everyone listening. Go check out these boys and appreciate you guys coming on, man. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate you guys for having us. Thank you so much. Thanks guys. Yeah, thank you guys. All right. See you fellas. Yep.